Hello everyone and welcome back to Arctic Retro. In this video I'm gonna build this Asinclair ZX Spectrum computer. So it's been a while since I built uh, a computer and the last one I built was uh, my Commodore 64 that I made a video series about uh, some time ago. You can uh, take a look at those if you want to see how I built a Commodore 64 machine. So now it was time to build another one and I found a kit for the ZX Spectrum that's called Harlequin and uh, yeah, it contains uh, the motherboard and all the necessary parts and also got uh, yeah, a case and a keyboard for it. So I think I have everything to get started on this project. So I'm not really sure how long it will take me. I am um, I'm gonna go about it quite slowly to make sure I don't do any mistakes with all those chips and all those components to solder. Uh, it is quite easy to do a mistake, put something the wrong way, for example. So I'm gonna check everything and make everything uh, in a ordered and uh, controlled <laughs> manner. So yeah, we'll see about that. Okay, here is the kit. It's the Harlequin Revision G Aesthetic Spectrum 48K clone. And it came with this assembly instruction manual. Has a link to some YouTube channel and uh, it came from Byte Delight. Here's the schematics. How to obtain a ROM. Yeah, and uh, the assembly sequence, all the components are listed with the nice pictures of the PCB after the different uh, steps. Yeah, so this looks promising. I'm gonna read this through obviously before I start. Uh, that's always a good idea. There can be some tips and tricks that you need to be aware of. I just want to take the opportunity to thank my sponsor PCB Way. They are very friendly people and uh, they also make uh, very nice PCBs for affordable prices and very fast delivery times. So if you need to have produced your own PCBs, then you should visit pcbway.com. And these are some uh, examples that they uh, made for me. And all of these you will find on their shared project site on pcbway.com. Right now they are hosting their fifth PCB design contest. And if you design PCBs yourself, you should definitely participate to win nice prizes. Also take a look at their other services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding. You find everything on pcbway.com. And here are all the components and uh, it came with this uh, Stroop waffles. <laughs> mm, I'm gonna eat those right away. Mm. Small waffles with uh, caramel inside. Very nice. Inside the kit. Here's all the chips, including the Silog Z80 CPU and all the sockets on the other side. Neatly packaged and uh, all the rest of the components are neatly bagged and uh, labeled correctly, hopefully. <laughs> and the main board here, it has a few um, components soldered on already, a couple of chips here. These are surface mounted. Okay, I'm gonna take a look at the manual and then I'll start uh, the job of soldering. So this is going to be a quite detailed video. Hopefully you like to see uh, a lot of soldering and uh, all the detailed work that goes into this. I'm not gonna just 
solder everything on and then it's finished and uh, ready to test. I'm gonna show you as much as I can. Obviously not every solder point <laughs> I'm gonna film but uh, a lot of things. Here's actually another ZX Spectrum uh, motherboard and this is a clone of um, the original uh, Issue 3B uh, from 83 but this was made in 2018 and uh, as we can see it's um, quite different. The old one obviously has a place for uh, the RF modulator. It has a CPU and uh, one ROM slot there and the ULA there but uh, this one is uh, quite different in uh, layout but it has some similarities. Hole for the speaker <laughs> and uh, of course the connectors are uh, the same. So why can't we just use uh, a replica of the original uh, ZX Spectrum uh, motherboard? Well, it's because uh, it's hard to get all um, the components that you need. For example, the ULA chip. Uh, you can't find that new anywhere. You have to find some uh, used ones and uh, they can be hard to come by. And it says here that uh, this revision G is now the most stable and compatible ZX Spectrum 48K clone ever. Now reading a little bit further, um, this one is uh, in fact an RGB to NTSC or PAL encoder. That's a voltage regulator and that's an inductor. So this board supports both PAL and NTSC depending on what kind of uh, crystal you put in it. For the ROM you actually need an original uh, ZX Spectrum EEPROM and uh, if you don't have that, then you need to make a copy by finding um, the ROM code and burning your own or buy some online. This board fits into the original uh, ZX Spectrum case, but it has an additional RGB output uh, connector. And if you're going to use that, you need to drill a hole for that. You can find uh, replicas of uh, the case online or you could 3D print one if you have a 3D printer. A little bit more about the ULA chip on the original ZX Spectrum board, uh, this one. Uh, this was one chip that combined several other uh, logic chips into one and uh, the reverse engineering resulted in uh, using a set of um, standard chips. Thus there is no more need for a ULA chip and there isn't one on this board. So in fact, that's why there's actually more chips on this board uh, than the original. But uh, all the chips can be found easily and are standard 74 uh, series uh, chips. About the ROM, um, you can actually configure if you have an original ROM or if you use a 27, 128 or 256 EEPROM instead you can even use a 28C256. So that means I can make my own ROM uh, based on a copy that I can read from the original ROM or find online. The kit didn't come with a power supply but you can use a standard uh, DC power supply with a voltage of 9 to 14 volts and the polarity does not matter on this one because it has an integrated uh, bridge rectifier. So you can actually use the original ZX Spectrum power supply. There's no 12, uh, minus five or minus 12 volts on this board. However, there are some hardware that uh, actually needs it. And if you are gonna connect some of those, you actually need to provide uh, those voltages um, using uh, a couple of connectors that can be hooked up to a separate power supply for that. For the video there is no RF modulator on this board, that's a good thing. You have composite uh, output which you can connect to most TVs and also the RGB output that you also can connect to many monitors or TVs. And that's via a small mini DIN 8 pin plug. And as I said, if you're gonna use that, you need to drill a hole for that in the case. All right, I think that was enough with uh, information. I'll uh, probably 
give you more details as I go. I'm just gonna start soldering. Um, usually you start with the smallest component first or the, the lowest profile components first, like resistors and the small capacitors and then maybe the sockets and then you solder in those with a higher profile like uh, capacitors and stuff like that. I'm gonna start soldering now and uh, I'm gonna start with the uh, diodes and uh, yeah there's actually some numbering here. The diodes I'm gonna start with is number one and then everything is numbered in uh, sequence here so I guess I just leave those in that order and try to not uh, mess it up like I already did here. Every component is labeled on the board and um, that's good. Hopefully everything is correct. Probably is since this is revision G. With new PCBs like this I always uh, clean them off before I start soldering. It is probably all good and clean but uh, there can be some uh, fat or yeah some oxidation uh, built up already. I'm using this uh, simple PCB holder. Uh, makes it a lot easier. You can turn the board around. I see that it makes a lot of glare sometimes. I'm gonna try and avoid that by angling the, <laughs> the board correctly. All right, ready to solder in the first component. It's a small diode and uh, with diodes you need to make sure that you place it in the correct direction and uh, diodes have this small black ring on one end and uh, if you find D9 it's probably somewhere here probably most of the time building this will go to searching for where to put the components but there's another one there that it has a little uh, line in one end so you know that is um, the correct direction of the component. Yeah, and D9 is over here. So um, there you see the little line and the black uh, mark should correspond with that. Also, you need to bend the pins and uh, yeah, I usually just use some uh, eye measuring here, but uh, yeah, there are tools uh, that can bend these pins. I don't have such a tool. What you should avoid is to bend uh, the pin right into the edge of uh, the component because then you can actually break it. So use a plier and try to eyeball it where you should uh, bend like that. Maybe this was a little too close. Uh, I think that will be correct. That fits perfectly. Okay, gonna solder that one in and then we have started. To hold the component in place, you can uh, just bend the pins uh, or the legs on the other side. Me personally, I don't like to do that. I just like them straight when I solder and uh, then I need to hold it either by my fingers or use some uh, blue tack like this, only this is white. <laughs> That's a simple solution. Or you could use some tape. I'm using my finest uh, solder iron tip here and also leaded uh, solder. I am gonna set up a fan to drag away the smoke. Um, when I do large solder jobs like this, uh, it's a good idea to at least try to have a fan drag away the um, toxic smoke. But if I solder just a couple of components, then I usually don't bother setting it up. But I try at least to not breathe in the smoke. You can see now the smoke just rises straight up, so I don't get it in my face. But if you do uh, larger solder jobs, uh, of course the room will be filled. Uh, so I also have a window open to uh, let uh, the air circulate a bit. Usually I just touch up on um, the solder points after I've cut uh, the legs, but uh, I'm gonna do that 
after I finish soldering everything. Also the cleaning, you see there's a little bit of um, flux from the solder tin. I'm gonna clean that off uh, when I finished with all the soldering. Then I can use some uh, water and get it real clean. Then we have another diode D10 which is here. This is a quite beefier one, it has quite thick uh, legs. Yeah, that sits there without any support, so I can just solder it right away. No, I can't uh, say that I'm an expert solderer. I have soldered for a few years, but uh, one thing you should try to make sure is that you add enough solder so that it goes through the hole and comes a little bit out on the other side. To get that correctly you just need uh, experience, <laughs> I guess. So here you can see it, it came out. Not sure if you can see it, I'm gonna zoom in. It came out on the other side, at least on this uh, leg here. Yeah, that one too. All right, I'm gonna finish uh, the rest of the diodes and then I'll be back with the next batch of components. Actually, I came back right away because the next one, uh, it's in fact uh, four diodes, but it's a bridge rectifier and it goes here. It looks like this, um, yeah. It has plus uh, marked down there and it also has plus marked on the component, so. It can only go this way then. So the holes are a little bit wider on the PCB than the component. I just want to make everything straight, as straight as possible. I'm not going to push it all the way down. Uh, I'm not using any additional flux since this is a brand new PCB of good quality. There's no need for that and there is some flux inside the solder tin obviously. And this is a very good solder tin. It's uh, lead based so uh, it melts and flows uh, quite easy. This board takes uh, a DC input, so why do they need to have a bridge rectifier? Well, it's probably because uh, then the polarity on the input doesn't matter. If it has a center negative or a center positive barrel connector. Now this big fat diode here, it has uh, such uh, thick legs. Uh, I couldn't uh, melt the solder, so I actually turned uh, up the temperature a bit. <laughs> Probably should have used a larger tip. Now well, that seems to work. Next is a bunch of resistors and uh, they're all packed in different bags for uh, different uh, values. So it's quite uh, easy to navigate. Um, I could of course uh, check uh, to uh, verify that all the values are correct, but uh, I think I'll have to uh, trust uh, this kit and that all things are correctly packed. This is quite boring, finding all the resistors when they are randomly spread around the board is uh, quite time consuming. So resistors are not polarized, so their direction doesn't matter, but I try to place them with the color bands in the same direction, that looks uh, nicer I think. I don't place too many components at the same time before soldering because then it will be a forest of component legs and easier to miss something. After soldering I just check uh, that the components are flush with uh, the board and they are. All right, I'm gonna solder in all the resistors. There's not much to it and then I'll be back. There's a slight problem and uh, that is that uh, some places there's a VIA uh, right under the silk screen. For example, this one R9. I looked very long to find it, <laughs> but then you have, um, you actually have the diagram on the manual or the build instructions. You can take a look there as well. These have a dot on one side, that's uh, the ground or the common, 
And on the PCB, pin one here is marked as a square and the other ones are round, so that's easy to figure out. And these I want to have straight and flush with the board. I just solder one pin first and uh, then I can adjust it a little bit. Yeah, it looks kind of straight. Just push it down and uh, melt the solder once more. So now it's completely flush with the board and I solder the rest. Okay, next is some transistors and uh, yeah, these are quite easy to get correctly. They have three legs and the symbol is uh, not to be mistaken, so if you place these the wrong way, then you didn't pay attention. <laughs> Q1 and Q2. Q3, Q4, Q5. Then the rest of the pins. Then there's a bunch of more transistors. These are uh, smaller types and they all go here uh, and uh, the holes are a little wider than uh, the transistor legs. So just going to bend them out a little bit. But here we need to check um, the polarity, the direction. Uh, since there is no transistor symbol to uh, follow, it's easy to just assume that uh, one direction is the correct, but as you can see it has some symbols B, C and E, and that's base, collector and emitter. So then we need to find out what is what on the actual transistor, and it's very small. But here we can see that uh, the left pin is marked with an E, so and uh, then you have a B on the right, so uh, then we know what to do. Then they go this way, which is uh, uh, the other direction uh, compared to what I thought. <laughs> so good thing I checked that. If you get a transistor the wrong way, then surely nothing's gonna work, or at least some parts will not work. So now I'm just gonna solder in those and I'll be back. That was all the transistors and uh, no, there's only a few uh, small ceramic capacitors left of the smaller part. And these small uh, capacitors are um, not polarized, so it doesn't matter what uh, direction you place them in. That was all the small capacitors in place and uh, next up is uh, this a little bigger ones, uh, electrolyte capacitors and uh, these are of course polarized, um, most of them at least, I guess all these are. So you need to mind uh, what direction you place them in. One uh, hole has a square and one is round, so um, that's the difference. Uh, only I don't remember what is minus or plus. It is actually explained here in the manual. Uh, the plus is uh, the square hole. And the plus is the longest leg and the minus is also indicated on the one side, so that's easy. Plus is the square. Then we have this 220 microfarad and in fact this is uh, not polarized. Uh, you have those kinds of electrolytes uh, too, so it doesn't matter what the direction it goes into. Actually, I skipped ahead a little bit uh, of my plan. I should have uh, soldered in uh, the sockets before I started with uh, these higher uh, components. So now I'm gonna pay for that because it's of course easier if you place all the sockets and then you just lay them board flat and uh, you can easily solder uh, them from uh, the backside. So I guess now I need to find some other way and yeah, I simply use my um, blue tack, white blue tack or tape. So I'm gonna start with those. 
So this will only hold them in place so that they don't fall out when I flip the board. However, I'm gonna push them down with my fingers after I have uh, soldered uh, two of the pins. I just soldered two of the corner pins first. Then I can just push it down and uh, make sure it is uh, flush with the board. There's a lot of sockets, uh, <laughs> several hundred solar points. I'm gonna do them all now and I'll be back afterwards. Wow, that was a lot of soldering. All the sockets are now in and uh, look at that. They all look uh, nice and flush with the board. Yeah, that was a lot of work and now remaining some um, few parts more. Um, contacts, pin headers, crystal oscillator, the speaker. So this board has uh, two crystal oscillators, one 14 MHz and uh, for the other one you have the selection. Uh, if you build a PAL or NTSC machine, I am in PAL land, so obviously I'm gonna use uh, the PAL version 4.433 MHz. And there's a Y2, goes into there. I'm gonna do the pin headers now and I got these uh, long um, strips here but uh, you need to cut them to the individual uh, jumpers. It is listed here in the document where the different uh, pin headers go. Most of them are three pins and then there's one with two pins for the reset. You can uh, of course just break them like that but I prefer to use uh, the side cutter, oops, <laughs> that flew into the ninth dimension. Now I think I can find it. Some of the pin headers goes between the sockets and it's a little bit tight space, oops. Now I soldered in the required pin headers, but um, pin header for jumper 12, 13, uh, 14 and 16 are actually not required. Well, 12 is required. I have soldered it in, I didn't mark it. 16 is not required for a normal operation. 13 is for a reset switch if you want that. And uh, the two other ones are extra voltage pins if you need some additional voltages as I mentioned earlier. But I'm gonna solder them in anyway so that I have them there. So that's the voltage pin headers. Uh, if you need uh, minus or plus 12 volts, it's that one. And this one, you can input uh, five and nine volts plus. Then we have uh, the contacts for um, the keyboard and the DC input. And it's important to get this, uh, the correct orientation. And uh, according to the document, they should not go in the same direction like this. This one is going with a wider part uh, pointing downwards like so. And the other one is uh, in fact uh, the opposite way with the wide part pointing up upwards. Solder one pin, then push uh, from the other side. As with all the components that has a plastic part, you should be very quick when soldering. Don't apply heat too long or you will melt the plastic. DC input uh, 
barrel connector goes here and that's some very large holes but uh, that is to provide strength to that contact uh, so you need to fill those holes really good with solder since the holes are a little big you might want to try and uh, align that contact so that it uh, looks nice just fill it up yeah i think that's enough and on the other side we can see that the solder came through and uh, yeah this is uh, really solid now next up the video connectors this is the rgp connector and this is a regular rca for uh, the composite video it's the same with those really large holes there i should have used a, a bigger tip rgb video goes here pins are maybe a little bit misaligned not really sure okay it's in it sits quite tight there uh, so no need to hold it from the other side all right gonna solder it in and uh, then we're almost done the mic and the ear contacts goes in there's no difference between those two they go here so there's only uh, five pins but there is uh, 10 holes <laughs> no need to solder the lower ones and the reason why there's more holes than uh, pins on the contacts is of course to make it possible to use different kinds of uh, contacts these holes are quite uh, tight and near each other so make sure you don't make any solder bridges between them wow last piece of the puzzle the little speaker for those of you who don't know the ZX Spectrum had a built-in speaker for audio the document doesn't tell but I guess it's these two uh, Holes here, you're gonna connect the speaker only. I can't see any trace that goes to those. Just gonna measure um, to ground. Yeah, definitely there's a, <laughs> there's a connection there. I guess that is for the speaker. What else could it be? So the recommendation was to actually use some of the cut off legs from uh, some of the components and uh, I obviously have plenty of those, so just going to do that. There's already solder on the terminals. Like so. So now we can just stick those into there and try to make a good fit. That works. Just hold it in place while I solder and then it will stay like that. Well, that didn't go exactly as I planned. Uh, one of the terminals uh, came loose. Probably it was pushed too hard when I bent the uh, legs there, but uh, hopefully it's not damaged. All right, look at that, it's complete. At least the soldering looks very nice. So now I'm gonna do some cleanup. I'm gonna go over all uh, the soldering here and uh, clean everything up. Check that I don't have any bridges or missing solder points. You might be thinking that I missed one socket, this one, but uh, it's not supposed to have a socket. Uh, uh, it's supposed to have a dip package with uh, eight resistors in it, and uh, that actually looks like uh, IC, but uh, it's gonna be soldered in. 
So I went through uh, all the solder points and touched them up a little bit because after cutting uh, the legs uh, the solder points can be a little bit ugly and uh, yeah touching them up makes them uh, in my mind better and uh, now it's time to do a little bit of cleaning of uh, the flux. I want to have this board uh, clean and shiny. So now I'm going to take this and clean it in soapy water because that's okay when uh, no uh, actual components are on. Well, a few uh, these passives, they can stand a little water. This speaker I should have perhaps waited with, but uh, I think it's uh, waterproof. Uh, it's made of plastic, so I'll try not to splash a lot of water on this side at least. Just going to clean the back side. All right, the uh, only thing left now is to populate the, all the chips and set the correct jumpers and uh, start a test, but uh, I'm not gonna do that right away. And look at that, I cleaned the backside. Uh, looks absolutely clean now. No leftover uh, flux at all. Before I populate the chips I'm going to do some basic um, measurements and uh, connect the um, input voltage to see that we don't have any shorts or anything like that. I just start by measuring on the 5 volt and ground pins on the CPU socket and uh, yeah it's uh, it has a resistance of 2.5 kilo ohms so uh, that's normal that is not a short and on the input uh, for the power supply, mega ohms, so nothing's shorted there, so I'm just gonna connect uh, a 9 volt um, power supply here, and uh, then we can see if we find any voltages on the board, and see if something starts smoking. <laughs> Do we have a voltage from the contact? Of course we have, yeah, 9 volts, 8.99, so let's check, um, the CPU it's uh, pin 11 and 29 just need to count 29 yeah there's uh, 5 volts into the CPU so this board looks um, to be working uh, voltage wise voltage regulation is working nice okay then I'll populate all the chips and uh, we can see if it actually works or not and now I start wearing the anti-static wrist and um, yeah, I'm going to refer to the document because it lists all uh, the different chips and where they go. So I'm uh, just going to start at U1 and follow the list. And U1 is of course uh, the Silog Z80 CPU. So according to the date code this was uh, produced in uh, 2010. So it's quite new. Well not that new it's 12 years <laughs> it can be a little bit painful to get um, all the pins in because they protrude outwards push firmly then we have u2 and u3 and that's the ram make sure the notch on uh, the chip points toward the notch on uh, the socket. Okay then, I'm gonna try and speed this up so uh, it won't get that boring to watch. So to not get confused I just uh, cross off everything. Uh, well, I think I did a mistake already. It says U2 is um, the ROM and U3 is RAM. But how come there's two RAM chips? Um, U8, yeah, U8 is also RAM. So this and this is the RAM, this is the ROM. <laughs> so you better pay attention. And the ROM we need to provide ourselves, so I'll do that last. So there is the RAM. Okay, now I'll speed it up.
Alright, that was all the chips in except this one which is uh, that uh, chip with uh, 8 resistors and uh, yeah, it doesn't matter what uh, direction it goes in. Um, this one was supposed to be soldered, you could use um, a socket if you want or you could use just 8 individual uh, resistors at uh, 470 ohms. I'm just gonna solder that one in. I guess that's the part that doesn't break easily. <laughs> I thought I was finished with soldering, but um, I'm not. But this is the last one. Now the board is definitely finished and uh, this speaker is a little loose, so I'm gonna secure it with a little uh, hot glue. Then the jumpers, and I am going to test with an original ZX Spectrum ROM first. I'm going to pull one out of uh, another ZX Spectrum if it's in a socket. If it's not, then I'm going to make my own, but um, just to test, I'm going to try that first. And the jumper for that is J12, and to use an original ROM, you jump the two last pins, pin 2 and 3. And then we have the setting for um, PAL or NTSC. To configure PAL or NTSC you need to set uh, all these three jumpers uh, to the same value and PAL is pin 2 and 3. It's tight between those chip sockets. Then there's a speaker setting and uh, jumper 15 and uh, to have the speaker on you set uh, pin 1 and 2. Here I have an original uh, ZX Spectrum uh, Issue 3 motherboard and uh, luckily the ROM is in a socket so I can test with that and that's a good thing. Then I have a benchmark. Uh, if I were to just burn my own ROM and test with that first, <laughs> I wouldn't be sure what was uh, faulty in the ROM I made or the machine if something didn't work initially. But uh, with a real working ROM, I know uh, that's not the problem. Now I have the keyboard and the case for uh, the machine here. I will take a look at that. Um, uh, pretty soon. Just need to test the machine first. By the way, this machine, I have made several videos about it before. I did a composite mod modification. Also made a video where I upgraded the, the RAM. This was originally a 16K and I upgraded to 48K. So take a look at those videos if you're interested to see how that went on. I'm gonna power on uh, the machine first without the ROM just to let it run for a while, see if anything starts to smoke or getting hot. Nothing gets hot except the CPU. It's a little bit warm, you can feel it. Everything else is uh, very cold. It is time to do the first test. Now without the ROM, I'm turning on the machine. Let's see if we can see anything at all. I just connected uh, the composite out via a Scott plug. Yes, look at that. There is picture, <laughs> but no colors. But that is promising. So I'm inserting the ROM now. This is the real test. Does it work or does it not? Look at that. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> It works on the first try. <laughs> and the picture quality looks to be very good. Uh, very crisp text, even though it's just a composite video. Now I haven't connected a keyboard, so I can't start typing or anything. But uh, yeah, this looks very good. So I'm gonna hook up uh, the keyboard now. I'm gonna use the keyboard for the old machine. Okay. Yes, <laughs> it works. Enter, yes, nice. Okay, the board worked at first try. I'm pretty pleased with that. That means I did everything correct. And uh, yeah, for the ROM, I'm now gonna 
take out that original ROM and make my own either by copying this uh, if I can or finding a binary file that I can download and burn to a EEPROM. For the ROM it can use 27128 or 27256 or 28C256. Uh, uh, I only have two 27128 so I only have two shots at getting this right because I don't have a UV eraser to erase if I do a mistake but uh, yeah try and do it correctly then. So this is a 23128 so I think this uh, EEPROM burner can read it out. So I struggled here a little bit uh, reading out the chip. Um, I tried with the 27128 uh, variants but I uh, could not read out the chip. Uh, it was my impression that the 23 series were compatible with the 27. However, by using a uh, 27256 chip, then turning off the pin detect and check ID, I actually managed to read out and here we can see yeah, that's definitely basic commands. However, a 256 chip is 32K and the one I'm gonna burn is, uh, is 16K. So I need to just make sure I don't burn any more than uh, up to 4000 hex. So now I insert that 27C128 EEPROM that I'm gonna burn to. And that's an ST chip. But there's only C512, so I need to select another one. So I'm gonna select an Atmel 27C128. And address is 3FFF. Okay, let's try. Nope, programming failed. So I could read the chip, but no, I. I inserted the other chip that I have and gonna try and read that first. So it seems to be blank. Yeah, gonna try and load again. I selected AMD now and I'm gonna flash and it goes up to 4000 and uh, program. Oh yes, it works. <laughs> so I think the other chip was maybe actually used before and yeah, verifying flash. Nice. In with the new ROM. And since this is a 27C128, it has a little different pinout than the original uh, ROM, even though they are compatible. Uh, so we need to set that jumper and that's J12 to one and two. All right, let's test with uh, my burnt ROM. Yes, look at that. That actually worked, <laughs> nice. Okay, so now I copy the ROM and uh, it works and uh, the machine is completed. Uh, only need to put it into my case and uh, fit the new keyboard and everything. And then we can uh, perhaps uh, test some games. Okay, time to uh, fully assemble the machine now. And uh, I'm not gonna bother with the RGB output for now because um, yeah, it requires a eight pin mini DIN plug and I don't have that so uh, I'm gonna get that later I guess and here are the case parts and I uh, went for uh, red <laughs> the keyboard plate it's a uh, red metallic I got the keyboard membrane well, actually I got two because I ordered one separately but uh, this case actually came with uh, a keyboard membrane already and there we have the keyboard mat. So this is a replica um, of the case. Um, it looks very nice. It's uh, good quality. It's not uh, 3D printed. Yeah, there's screws and there's some uh, rubber uh, feet. Nice. Yeah, that fits perfectly. On the original uh, motherboard, there's one screw uh, on the actual motherboard, which goes there, but there's nothing in this um, board here. So keyboard flat cables. Yeah, they go in real good. The case, at least the top part, 
is a little bit warped but I guess with the screws it will come into its place. Then the rubber feet, just gonna clean off um, the plastic with a little alcohol um, to make sure it sticks well. There's even some plastic uh, wrap on top of those. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, it's a little bit uh, warped, doesn't uh, go all the way down. A uh, little bit of opening there and there's no screw in the middle on the front. So just have to leave it that, maybe it will adjust itself. The rubber or dead flesh. <laughs> then the front plate and uh, it's just uh, double sided tape. Just gonna clean a little bit around. No, this is a vital step to get this correctly aligned and uh, might not be easy. I just start from one side and uh, only have one shot at this because I only have one front plate. Yes, I think that went all right. This end does not stick. I took it off again. Um, there's just a little edge there to uh, make the tape grip to, but uh, <laughs> the tape isn't uh, high enough. So maybe I'm just gonna use a little bit of uh, glue. Yes, I'm gonna use a little bit of uh, plastic glue. Try again. Maybe I ruined the tape now, but uh, we'll see. Okay, I think that sits okay, not perfect. Uh, I think this uh, face plate was not the best quality, but uh, it's red, that's why I got it. And uh, doesn't it look nice? All right, time to test some uh, games and stuff on this uh, machine. First I'm gonna test uh, loading from uh, tape and I'm using this tape emulator, the SVI CAS. Very handy device and I have two games here, Cauldron and Bomb Jack. Uh, let's test with uh, Cauldron. Enter uh, load and play. I'm not sure if I plugged into the right uh, input or to the output. <laughs> yeah, nothing happened, so I guess I used the wrong contact then. Now let's try again. Yeah, that looks better. Cauldron is loading. Uh, however, there wasn't much color here, <laughs> so that's not right. I just stopped it. I'm gonna test, uh, see if there's any color. Is everything correctly connected here? And I was so pleased with myself that this was uh, working. <laughs> I need to investigate, maybe I read the, the manual wrong, maybe I have uh, set it into NTSC, so I need to open it up. Yes, I think the instruction is actually wrong. Um, if I move jumper nine and then set border three, we have color. <laughs> Okay, good thing it was only that. <laughs> so I moved this jumper from the bottom two pins to the top two pins. But um, the documentation says that it should be all the same on all three jumpers. However, that's not correct. Now let's try. That's better. Picture quality is uh, quite good. Uh, there's a little bit of a shaking maybe in the picture some places. So. You see the shakiness now that I zoomed in. Of course, uh, filming uh, 
a screen is not optimal so it looks better than uh, you see on this video all right it loaded uh, i don't have a joystick here now i'm gonna test that uh, right after this but uh, let's see three is keys <laughs> okay okay <laughs> I just adjusted the camera a little bit and I know it's more correct. Okay, now I'm gonna test this device. It's a ZX uh, Frankenstein and uh, yeah, it's a SD card reader and also a one joystick port, Kempson joystick. Let's see if we can load some games. I have the same uh, memory card into this as I had in the SVI CAS. And it goes into the expansion port, uh, of course. Yeah, it's in. And now I'm gonna try a bomb jack. But it still loads from uh, tape, so you need to connect a cable program bomb jack. I'm gonna find a joystick to hook up. Got this simple gamepad here. With a solution like this, it's obviously a little bit in the way of, <laughs> of you if you have uh, the TV like I have. It loaded just fine. So I'm gonna use uh, P for Kempston and one for one player. <laughs> yeah. That works. Okay. Well, let's see if I can round the first level. Yeah, I made it to level two. level three okay i think that's enough with the playing and this machine works just fine i don't have any cartridges or other uh, uh, things to test with but uh, this is uh, quite good enough for me all right i think that was it for this video uh, i just want to hear your opinion on something if you want to uh, comment uh, in the video below here. <laughs> Did you prefer the ZX Spectrum or the Sinclair machines over the Commodore machines uh, back in the day? Let me hear that. So this was quite fun build. Uh, everything went smooth, no issues and uh, yeah <laughs> I uh, like that but sometimes I can prefer that some faults occur that I have to uh, <laughs> try to figure out but uh, yeah, pretty pleased with this machine. I now have a brand new ZX Spectrum to play with. I just want to test out that RGB video later. Unfortunately, I didn't have the correct contact or cable to use with it. Thanks for watching and please hit that subscribe and the like button if you want to see more. And a special thanks to my Patreons. See you, bye bye.